welcome to everyone who just arrived. My name is Zach Semke. I'm director of Passive House Accelerator. We're super happy that you're here for this Passive House crash course. You're going to be joined, we'll be joined by Michael Ingui of Vax Ingui Architects, who will um, get us kicked off at the beginning of the program and will also be available for Q&A afterward. Speaking of Q&A, we're going to um, have a Q&A concierge, uh, Sydney Gladius. So Sydney, can you, can you uh, say hello so people see you? Hi everyone, I'm Sydney. Thanks Sydney. So as questions uh, occur to you during the presentation, please uh, put them into chat and Sydney will be tracking those questions. And once we're done with the, for the presentation and ready for the Q&A session, she'll invite you to come on screen and unmute yourself and uh, ask your question and we'll be able to have a, a back and forth that way. Um, okay, so I, I want to introduce Michael Ingui real fast. Michael Ingui is principal of Baxter Ingui Architects, where he's become a leading practitioner in Passive House, especially Passive House Retrofit. He's also the founder of the Passive House Accelerator um, and a very inspiring figure for many and a close friend of mine. So Michael, why don't you take it away? Thanks, Zach. Um, hi, everyone. Uh, as Zach mentioned, I'm Michael Ingui from Bax Ingui Architects. Uh, we're a, a, a New York City-based uh, architecture firm. Our office is in Manhattan. I live in Brooklyn. I am an NYIT uh, grad uh, from way back when. And, um, and for the most part, we, we do a lot of houses out of the city uh, as well as in the city. We do a lot of these townhouse retrofits. Um, a lot of our projects are client driven in terms of style. So although I tend to be a little bit more modern and, and well, definitely more modern and, and, and simple, uh, some of our clients like it to be more traditional. We love to kind of play with spaces and create kind of fun um, elements within houses. And for the most part, what we do is a lot of high end uh, res uh, renovations. So for me, um, I'm always asked, you know, uh, why don't more people do a passive house? and the answer for that typically for the type of projects I do is because they don't know how to, because every project you're seeing on this screen is a passive house. So um, uh, you don't have to necessarily have uh, one particular type. In fact, um, out of all the projects that we're working on, as soon as you're doing a full gut project in Manhattan or outside of Manhattan in Brooklyn or, or in the boroughs or really anywhere, once once you're going far enough, it's it's always going to be a passive house as far as we're concerned. Uh, we've learned how to do a better cellar slab detail. Why wouldn't I do that? We've learned how to keep our houses um, sealed from all bugs and dust. Why wouldn't I do that? And um, uh, provide filtered fresh air. And this is the reason why our clients are coming to us wanting to do it. And I have to be honest with you, as a designer and as a design student, um, I don't know that I really cared very much about any of this, um, but you should because it actually frees the designer. I don't need um, radiators so I can do big windows. I don't need uh, HVAC to come up to my window so I can do double light spaces. I can get away with a lot of things that I couldn't otherwise. So we're actually using Passive House as a bit of a tool to do it. Now, one of the reasons we can do that is we have one systematic approach to everything. We've learned how to do it, what to do next. And, and regardless of the type of projects and the type of teams and the number of contractors, we're following kind of a clean systematic approach, just like they teach you in school where you, you know you got to do one step and then the next step and the next step. And it works really, really well. We learned over time though that other people had other systematic approaches and other ways of doing it where we could do these things really beautiful designs and get really high performance. And we really wanted to, to share what we were doing with people so that they could learn more from us. We'd open up our job sites all the time to you know 50, 100 people. We do student tours all the time. We still do it for a bunch of schools and, um, it, and it's fun. We do it with other professionals, but then we really wanted to try to do something and make it even bigger. And that is really one of the reasons the Passive House Accelerator exists. We were speaking at conferences, and we've realized that at the conference, this person knew that, this person knew the other thing. And, you know, we can all complain about climate change and we could all protest to get people to change things for climate change. Or we could just build better buildings right now. And, um, and, and we should protest and we should push our politicians to do stuff, but we should also just build better right now. And what's really interesting is the Passive House community and the high performance building community, they know how to. So what the accelerator does is it aggregates all that information into one place 
so that when someone really wants to do more and do better, no, now they don't have to. I mean, people have done everything from car dealerships to hotels, to um, uh, large houses, small houses, student housing, uh, shopping centers. They, they've done it all in past house already, swimming pools. So you can do everything you want to do. You just have to learn how. The accelerator is an aggregator for that information. Uh, there's a lot of other great sources out there as well. We also help you find those. I'll introduce Zach now uh, because the accelerator, although I was the founder of it, uh, it wasn't really what it should have been. Uh, I, I wanted it to be this incredible great thing where we aggregated information and provided that information in a really clear and clean way. It wasn't really that. And then Zach became available and just really knows how to speak. You'll see in a second. Um, knows the stuff, knows how to communicate it well, and knows how to create a beautiful website where everything's really clear. Um, you can kind of see it now from the Pass House 101 to the Attend, which if you press that every Tuesday night, including tonight, it's our, our, our one year anniversary of Tech Tuesday, which is more construction centric. And then um, our Happy Hour Wednesdays, which is more design centric. Um, although I think we mix both quite a bit. We do these live events every at 7 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, um, every Tuesday and Wednesdays. Then you have the Explore, where you can learn about all different projects and network, all the other great community groups and other groups that are actually doing stuff. So the website's a really good source. You should go to it. It's a great place to get inspiration. It just also, it, it's an answer-filled website. Though. These are people who are doing. They're not people who want to do. They're, they're people who are actually doing that you can learn from because they're giving you all their information for free. And that's one of the things I really love about the Passive House community. Um, they all share. They're sharing their answers openly, um, stuff that they work decades to do. So with that, I will uh, give the floor to Zach so he can start the 101. All right. Awesome. Thank you, Michael. Um, and uh, no pressure, of course. Thanks for the introduction. <laughs> So I, I want to st start with this slide. We talked a little bit about the climate crisis, that, and this slide kind of speaks to my motivation for being involved in Passive House, and I think it might uh, speak to some of the folks who are on, on this call. So what we're seeing here is the sunrise as seen by the International Space Station, and that thin blue line that's arcing across the screen is our atmosphere. So we tend to think of the atmosphere as this big thing because we can go outside and look up at the sky and it's everything that's very large, but the, the atmosphere is actually very thin. If the earth were an apple, the atmosphere is as thin as the skin on that apple. Yet we're pumping over 100 million tons of carbon pollution into that life sustaining layer, that very thin layer every day. And a big part of that is coming from buildings. About 40% of global carbon emissions come from our buildings. And the vast majority of that comes from operating our, our buildings. The rest of it comes from building our buildings. Um, so as aspiring designers and architects and builders and practicing designers and architects and builders, we all have more power than most to make an impact on climate solution making. Um, and the way that that looks for us at the, in the past files community is right here. The math is fairly simple in terms of thinking about how we can transform buildings from part of the climate problem to becoming part of the climate solution to actually potentially being a form of climate action. Um, so we start with uh, super energy efficiency in buildings through passive house. Um, we also uh, look at the embodied carbon of our buildings. So embodied carbon is this wonky term that refers to all of the carbon that's emitted to create the materials and the components and put uh, that go into a building and put all the, those together in, in the construction process. So it's essentially the upfront carbon emissions from constructing a building. Um, we also then um, focus on electrifying everything in, in our buildings and providing the power to electrify everything from renewable energy. And together, those four things come together to, uh, to address the climate problem through buildings. So in this presentation about Passive House, I'm going to focus on three sections, kind of three, three um, modules, sort of quick ones. Why Passive House? What is Passive House? And how do we do Passive House? So I talked a little bit about um, my motivation, the, the climate crisis, and how buildings can be part of the, the solution. That's certainly part of the why. Um, but we're also looking at 
the health and happiness of the uh, occupants um, who are in the buildings, the, all of us who are living and working and playing in buildings, we're inside 90% of the time. Uh, so that so it's really important that, that buildings help serve um, the health and happiness of people. So we're gonna, I'm going to go through some of these some of these benefits. I think that the most um, kind of visceral thing about going into a passive house for the first time, and certainly was the case for me about 12 years ago, is how fresh the air is inside passive house buildings. I think that we've become so accustomed in conventional polluting buildings. Um, we've become so accustomed to stale air that it has very high CO2 levels and maybe some other and, and other indoor air pollutants that um, I think we, we, we can be surprised by what it feels like to be in a space that, that is really has great filtered fresh air. Um, and that's one of the uh, key uh, benefits of passive house buildings because passive house buildings have a balanced ventilation system that is constantly actively expelling stale polluted air out of the building and bringing in filtered fresh air into the building. Um, and that has real impacts on people's ability to, to even um, think like at school. So this, this diagram here is from the architecture from Archetype based in the UK. And they have, they've done this, this evaluation of three schools in the UK. The yellow is a conventional school built in the 1970s. The green is a green building that relies on natural ventilation. Uh, so opening windows uh, for ventilation. And the blue building is a passive house school. And there are three bars because they're evaluating it in June, in October, and in December, and looking at the CO2 levels um, for for the, each month for each of those buildings, and you can see that the conventional building has moderately okay um, air quality in terms of CO two in June. Um, in October, it gets pretty bad um, with CO two levels getting up to twenty five hundred parts per million, and by December, it's really actually kind of in dangerous territory, up up pushing toward thirty five hundred parts per million. The natural ventilation um, project. Uh, is doing great in the, in June when it when it feels comfortable to open the windows, um, but by October you're already getting over 15 hearts, parts per million, and in December uh, well above 1500 parts per million um, when it's it does it's too um, uncomfortable to keep the opens the windows open. By the way, passive house you can totally open windows whenever you want, uh, just to to uh, get that out there. But as you can see with the, the, the blue, the passive house school, we're underneath that, that uh, 1,000 parts per million mark. Those red lines are, according to the Harvard School of Public Health, um, at the first red line at about 1,000 parts per million um, of CO2, cognitive function declines by 15% at that point. At the next line at about 1,400 parts per million, Cognitive function, according to the Harvard School of Public Health, goes down by 50 percent. And at 2,500, the study the, the study that this is based on, they they stop they they kind of would stop the the research session if if they got that high just on ethical grounds. So the 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 health um, and happiness of our of our um, students can be well served by by passive house. All right. So health is, I think probably the most important benefit of, of Passive House Comfort is a close runner up. Um, these are comfortable spaces because um, we have robust uh, building envelopes that provide a even surface temperatures on, on the interior, even sur um, interior surface temperatures. Uh, so what that means is that we don't have a cold surface temperature where air hits it and drops and creates a downdraft. And we, so we, have we don't have drafty conditions um, at, at, the, at the envelope, the exterior walls. We also don't have radiant discomfort. The, our bodies are really great at, at sensing cold surfaces and we don't have that in a passive house. And because passive house has even surface temperatures, it also means that helps the, the air temperature to not be stratified. So we don't have that experience of having cold toes and a hot, and, and a hot head uh, in, in the winter time. So comfort is a really key benefit of passive house. Another thing that people notice when they go into passive, uh, passive House for the first time is how peaceful and quiet these buildings are. 
That comes because we've got these, these robust building envelopes that are airtight with great windows and doors, and that all of, all of those elements that make these buildings very energy efficient also make them very quiet. So, they're, so they can be sited next, you know, close to busy intersections or a train line, um, airport, and um, the, the occupants are, are shielded from the outside noise. So this, this analysis from NK Architects and the acoustical engineer that they work with shows that a, an outside noise that would create a 70 decibel noise inside the building um, is reduced to a 60 decibel noise inside the building if it's a passive house. Um, and that may not sound like a lot, but the, this is a log, decibels are measured on a logarithmic scale. So that's actually a 50% reduction in the noise level of, of, of that noise. So it's actually, it's, it's very significant. No bugs or dust. So if you live in a city, if you live in New York in an old building, for example, you know about dust, dust filtering through cracks and crannies in, 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 the, um, in the walls. Um, well, with, with Passive House, we, the airtight construction stops those, that, that dust from infiltrating, also stops bugs from being able to crawl through, through the walls. Um, and uh, Michael can speak to this uh, uh, in questions and answers, but this is actually a really powerful selling point for, for his clients as he's talking about uh, retrofit work in New York. No unwanted moisture odors. So I mentioned the, the balanced ventilation system. The, the way that these ventilation systems are set up in Passive House is that they're actively extracting air, bad air from the kitchens and the bathrooms and expelling it outside and then bringing in filtered fresh air uh, from outside to uh, living spaces. Uh, so any, any smoke or, or bad smells um, is quickly uh, dealt with. And because they're airtight structures, it also means that uh, bad air from outside doesn't inadvertently come through the building envelope. And instead it goes through a, ventil a, a filtered ventilation system where the air can get cleaned. So durable, I mentioned uh, air tightness a few times. These are, these are you know, robust building assemblies that are airtight, which means that we're carefully engineering them to avoid uh, moisture intrusion and vapor to come in and create rot and mold and problems. So that makes these buildings um, lower cost uh, to maintain and to, and to operate. Um, it also eliminates callbacks for, for contractors. So builders, that's one of the, the big risks for a builder is being called back later to, to fix a building failure. Um, so it's a big peace of mind for, for builders. And you'll hear once a, once a builder has done a passive house, they'll say often um, that uh, they're, they're not, you know, they won't go back to the old way of doing things um, because they're so, um, convinced that this, the durability is, is the way to go. Predi predictable performance. So um, unlike other uh, green building uh, certification programs um, is, that have a gap, that what we call the performance gap, so that's the mind the gap, the performance gap between what is um, modeled performance and, and what, is, what is predicted performance and what actually happens in the real world. Um, you maybe maybe you've heard some examples of lead buildings that are performing poorly. Um, passive house has a very close correlation between model performance and then the actual performance in the world, the actual energy consumption of the building. Um, and the reason for that is that we're we're um, it's a a form of of green building that is really deeply rooted in building science and building physics, um, and has. Um, time-tested uh, modeling software that, ha that, that is dialed in to create that, that correlation between what's predicted and what's actual. Um, this is data from FIAS um, looking at, a, at 18 multifamily projects and the, perform the, the dark blue lines shows what's mo the modeled EUI. EUI means energy use intensity and it's measured in kilo BTUs per square foot per year. Um, so the, the, the blue is modeled, the red are years of measured EUI. And the, you can see that there is individual variation um, between buildings, and that can be explained um, often by different occupant behavior. But on average, when you look at the average modeled EUI of 16.1 compared to the average measured EUI of 17.2, you can see that there's a really close correlation. So with, with Passive House, you know what to expect in terms of the performance um, of, of buildings. 
passive house also is more affordable than conventional polluting buildings uh, to, because it's more affordable to operate because the energy bills are lower, the maintenance costs are lower. And while often a passive house will cost incrementally more than a conventional building because it's better built and has a more robust envelope, the extra um, debt service to invest in that passive house can be easily offset by utility bill savings over, over time. So on a monthly basis, the cost of, of, of owning um, one of these buildings it, it can also be lower. Also, the upfront cost of passive house is going down um, quickly, uh, and in some cases approaching zero. Um, as, as we are learning how to do these buildings better and better, particularly with larger buildings like multifamily buildings. So this is a scatter plot showing 268 construction proposals made to the Pennsylvania Housing Finance Agency, PHFA. And PHFA is in charge of awarding low-income housing tax credits or LITEX to affordable housing developers in Pennsylvania. It's a very competitive process. It's an important way to fund affordable housing. And over this, from 2015 and 2018, they got these 268 proposals. And what we're looking at is project cost on the y-axis and project size in square footage on the x-axis. And you can see there's a variation there. And the, the blue here shows the projects that applied that were passive house um, in this pool. And in this case, we actually are seeing a, a lower construction cost for the passive house compared to the conventional construction projects. Um, so $173 per square foot compared to $175 per square foot. Now, I don't think it's actually true at this point that passive house is cheaper to do than conventional construction in Pennsylvania. It's possible um, because there's big savings in the mechanical equipment when you invest in the envelope. I think it's probably more like it's, it, it's at, at cost parity. But this is showing that we're getting to that place where um, for many building types, this, this better technology is... Um, is eliminating a, a construct. There's the, the cost delta between this better technology and the, the conventional building technology is going away. And we're super energy efficient. There's no better way, uh, no more predictable, more kind of revolutionary um, way to improve energy efficiency than passive house right now um, in, terms of a, in terms of a system. So uh, you can see here, this, this is looking at a single family house um, and a typical, a typical existing single family house will use about 80 kilobtus per square foot per year, have an EUI of about 80. Energy Star brings it down to just over 40. You can see the typical, the typical passive house is well below 20 EUI. Um, so, and that means way lower operational carbon emissions coming from these buildings. So this is speaking to that climate action piece that we talked about before. And it's complementary. So this energy efficiency plays well with this, this overall math that I laid out at the beginning of the presentation of low, you know, passive house plus low embodied carbon plus electrify everything plus clean energy. Um, it also um, it, it plays really well with a greening grid because as we are putting more and more solar energy and, and uh, wind energy onto our grids, those are intermittent sources. The cool thing about the, ener uh, the energy services provided by energy efficiency, sometimes called megawatts, is that the, 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 um, these buildings are kind of like power plants of megawatts, right? And they produce the most megawatts when energy demand is the greatest. So that's the, the it's exactly the right time for them to be providing these energy services. Um, and that, it's a beauty, a beautiful thing about what energy efficiency contributes to the clean energy transition. We're also looking at more and more the importance of passive survivability in our buildings um, and the resilience of buildings. So we, how we can weather the wild weather, the extreme temperatures and grid insecurity that is being caused by climate change. Um, and so the, the a photo on the top there is a passive house in Austin uh, during the deep freeze there when the power went out and, and there were sub freezing temperatures for days, on, uh, days in a row. And the, the photo below shows a passive house development in Portland, Oregon during the heat dome that brought temperatures up to 115 degrees Fahrenheit in, in Portland, which was completely 
unheard of. Uh, and uh, most of the buildings in uh, the Pacific Northwest don't have air conditioning. So this is anecdotal, but we have um, the, the house on the top there, um, the, all the houses around it, the, the interior temperatures went down to below freezing with, you know, with, uh, shortly after like 24 hours of no power. Um, after a few days, the temperatures were still in the 50s in that building. So not balmy, but certainly survivable and, and um, um, you know, they were able to weather the storm there. Similar story with the, with the um, buildings in Portland. Um, our, my house was, was up in the hundred, I live in Seattle. We got there. I do not have a passive house yet. And we had, um, temperatures going, going up above a hundred, um, in, in our house. Um, the, the building, the passive house buildings here, um, never got, um, out of the eighties. So, uh, this passive survival is, is key and also wildfire smoke and, and outdoor pollution because we have filtered fresh air, uh, coming through these, these ventilation systems we're able to maintain healthy indoor air quality during, during these crazy um, events that are happening. So I wanna be careful with this, this, um, this benefit because there's um, creating a just project, a, you know, something that we would cons consider a just building is not something that happens by accident. It takes a lot of intention um, and a lot of care and a lot of wisdom. Um, so, but if buildings can be part of climate action, and if we're creating buildings that are resilient to the vagaries of this kind of global weirding, and we can do it in an affordable way that can be, uh, that where we can provide equitable access to these buildings, then Passive House provides a um, pathway to create just work and to have buildings not only be part of climate action, but also be part of climate justice. All right, so that's the why. Uh, the what, so what is Passive House, but what buildings are Passive House, and Michael, Michael alluded to the, this a little bit, and what is certification, just kind of the nuts and bolts. So first of all, Passive House can be any style and any building type, and it's a little bit confusing, so please don't be, um, confu don't be um, uh, kind of led astray by the term house, because that connotes that we're talking about single family houses, and we're not. I mean, it, passive house can be single family houses, but it can be anything. It could be office buildings, schools, museums, firehouses, indus, industrial facilities, it can be anything. In the German passive house, H-A-U-S, connotes building. So it's, much, it's a much broader term than, than thinking of just single family houses. So any style, any building type. Um, here are a bunch of schools, elementary school, high school, um, uh, college campus building. Uh, here are high-rise buildings, one built in Bilbao, Spain on the left, one under construction, the Winthrop Center in the center in Boston, and one on the uh, boards in Vancouver, BC on the right, the butterfly. Uh, multifamily buildings, uh, that's a major growth happening right now in North America with multifamily buildings. We, we're looking at projects from Seattle, Vancouver, New York, um, and uh, and single family, of course, with, and it can be like high design, it can be mid-century modern, it can be traditional. There's a cool Victorian project that's on our website now. Um, it really can be any style. Um, yeah, there's a lot of flexibility. So in terms of certification in, in, in North America, there are two pathways to Passive House certification. One administered by Passive House Institute in Darmstadt, Germany, and another administered by FIAS in Chicago, Illinois, and the, the two organizations are not affiliated. Um, and there are important differences between the certifications. Um, for example, the FIA certification alter, changes the, the specific targets that a building needs to, to um, go after for certification based on the location and its climate. Um, but there are many commonalities that, that uh, these two certifications share. Um, well, one, they have certifications for new retrofit and also for net zero um, projects, um, but um, more kind of fundamentally, they draw on the same um, suite of uh, passive design uh, principles that I'll, that I'll um, summarize in a little bit. They're both grounded in building science. They both uh, use uh, powerful uh, software to help the designer optimize. And they have uh, a focus on these three performance metrics. So the three are thermal energy demand or load. 
Um, so how much energy the building is using to heat or cool. And so both certifications are, are defining a very low level of thermal energy demand um, uh, allowed for heating and cooling, which means uh, lower operational carbon emissions. Total energy demand also um, very, very uh, low levels of total energy de demand uh, allowed um, in both. So this is so that includes heating and cooling, but also uh, domestic hot water and uh, plug loads. And you're plugging your computers, the lighting, everything. Uh, so that needs to be low. And air tightness. So air tightness is um, quite stringent for both certifications. And the reason that air tightness is important is uh, are many. So one one is that um, air tightness is a is a measure of construction quality. Another is air tightness ensures durability because it 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 helps stop the flow of moisture into building assemblies with 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 the air. And finally, it's an important part of um, a key piece of energy efficiency. All right. So I should say also that both um, both PHI and FIAS offer certified passive house consulting training and certification, um, as well as certified passive house tradesperson or certified passive house builder training and certification. So um, we joke that um, that passive house is not rocket science, it's building science. Uh, and you definitely, so, so as you do these trainings, you kind of, you bone up on the basics of building science and building physics, but you don't have to be a physicist to do these, to do passive house. I think that's the, a key message that we wanna share is that this is a, a, a way for regular old designers and architects to be able to harness the power of building physics uh, through this system, through the, through the software um, to get really great results and optimize for performance and cost. Um, and you can, you can get trained up and we'll, we'll share resources at the end of the presentation uh, for, for how to access that training. Um, but the tools, I mentioned the, the modeling tools, the, the tool, we're, we're displaying them here. So for the PHI side, they, you, we use the PHPP, which stands for the Passive House Planning Package. On the FIA, for FIA certification, we use WUFI Passive, um, uh, which is on the right. And then for both, we use these other kind of supplementary tools th for thermal and hygrothermal analysis. Hygrothermal is not a, a, a typo. Hygrothermal refers to the behavior of heat and moisture. And so uh, uh, as we're doing these, these projects, we're looking at, at the way that heat and moisture interact with the building assemblies to make sure that they are robust and, and durable. Okay, so how are we doing on time? I'm, okay, I'm gonna plow through here. So um, I'm gonna do a real quick crash course on the key design principles of Passive House. And I'm gonna focus most on the top five that you see here. Those are kind of the classic five Passive House design principles. And then I'll just touch really briefly on the bottom five um, that also kind of sh uh, shore everything up. Uh, so, diving into continuous insulation. So continuous insulation is the first principle of passive house design and construction. This is like the, in the winter, it's like the warm wool sweater, um, but whether it's winter and, or summer, in the winter, we're using the con continuous layer so that the heat stays inside. And in the winter, we, uh, the summer, we're using that same layer to make sure that the cool stays inside. And it's continuous so that there are no weak spots um, that allow energy transfer. So this is a uh, rock wool insulation being um, uh, held uh, in place with uh, rain screen battens on a single family house. No thermal bridges. So thermal bridging is a really key piece of uh, the calculations that go into passive house design and construction. And a thermal bridge is basically any building envelope that allows energy, heat energy to transfer across or through the thermal barrier. So, um, and they're really important to avoid because they can, they can, um, rob your, your building of heat during the winter or allow the cool, cool to uh, escape during, during the, the summer. They also um, allow uh, moisture to, uh, to condense inside um, these, these otherwise um, highly thermally insulated um, assemblies and create all sorts of problems. So we need to avoid thermal bridging when we can. So examples of thermal bridges would be like um, a um, uninterrupted concrete slab that goes from inside to outside, or a poor window frame, 
or um, a steel beam that penetrates a, an exterior wall. So this beautiful building here, the Aqua Building in Chicago, has these wonderful curvilinear balconies, right? But in the winter, this building is doing its very best to be a massive radiator, trying to heat the, the Great Lakes region, right? Uh, because each one of those balconies is a thermal bridge that is just dumping heat out from, from inside to outside. It's a big problem. It could have been avoided and the design could have been identical if thermal breaks were introduced um, at, the, at this juncture here. So the, sh the Shook Isocore balcony connector would, could be one simple solution to um, introduce a break and, and eliminate that thermal bridge in that building. But we don't have to have a dramatic high design high rise to see the impacts of thermal bridging. Just uh, wood studs in a regular house can, can be a, a, a thermal bridge. So we could avoid this with a continuous insulation layer um, and, uh, and start to transform this design into, into a passive house. So passive house designers spend, spend some, some time really thinking through and avoiding thermal bridges by creating thermal breaks. All right, airtight. So uh, the air tightness is, is like a, a windbreaker for the building. Um, making sure that the, that that wind doesn't wind and cold air and moisture don't penetrate the envelope and 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 uh, the rest of the building, and the, the in the design process we do a red pencil test and you can kind of see a simple version of that in the diagram on the left, where we make sure that there that there an unbroken air tightness layer can be drawn in uh, in all cross sections, I um, mean we we incorporate um, membranes and and sheets and tapes and, and uh, sealants to make sure that there is this unbroken air tightness layer that goes around from component, to, you know, from window to wall, et cetera. And then we test that with a blower door testing to make sure that everything's uh, um, working properly and, and is tight. We, we do air testing during the construction process to, do, to check uh, periodically. And then at the end, air tightness testing is a key piece of certification. Um, and uh, uh, achieving passive house. So high performance windows and doors. You can imagine we've, done, we've gone to all this trouble to create these advanced build, building envelopes and then we're punching them with all these holes uh, for windows and doors. And so it's key that we're tying in the air tightness layer, the water resistant um, barrier and the thermal barrier, the, the insulative barrier into um, these, these windows and, and, and doors. Um, and you can see an example with some, uh, with some insulation and thermal breaks on this triple pane windows. Typically, but not always, the windows will be triple pane. Um, and the impact of this, it, it has important comfort impacts and very important thermal performance impacts. And this is a, a, a cool kind of side-by-side -side analysis that I'm gonna take just a moment to unpack. So what we're looking at is two wall assemblies with um, each wall assembly here has a window wall ratio of 20%. So it's the same percentage of window to wall on the left and on the right. Both walls are code minimum walls plus um, a zip R layer. So slightly better than code in this case for this comparison. On the left, we're using a, a good conventional window, which has an R value of about three. On the right, we're using a passive house window that has an R value of seven. And the effective wall value for these two assemblies is, is very different because one is using a passive house window. You can see that for the, convention, the wall with a conventional window, the effective wall R value is 9.9. .9. For the passive house window uh, wall assembly, it's 15.8, so almost double. And that's 20% a 20 window to wall ratio is not huge, right? So it's a big impact. Now take a look at, so now let's assume, all right, we'll have a code wall on the right and we'll try to make up for the bad windows on the left with a ton of insulation. So in this case, we're adding like 18 inches of insulation. So going, getting really heroic with our insulation on the left, bringing it up to R90 for wall insulation. So you have an R R90 wall insulation on the left, R17 on the right, but the effective wall R value for the two walls is identical at 13.2 because you have crappy windows on the left compared to, and passive house windows on the right. All right, so one of the coolest things um, 
I think about uh, the technology that goes into passive house are heat recovery ventilation ventilators or sometimes energy recovery ventilators. So this is the balanced ventilation. I've been talking about this whole presentation where we're, we're expelling stale air out and bringing in filtered fresh air in 24 seven all the time. The cool thing about this is that the, these units have a heat exchanger inside. It's basically a honeycomb full of a whole bunch of straws that create a, a huge surface area um, and allow the outside air that's coming in the cold, this is in the winter time. So the outside air is cold coming in, goes through the heat exchanger. Um, meanwhile, the inside stale air that's conditioned, it's warm, is going out the other direction. And the two, uh, the en heat energy from the inside air is tr passively transmitted to the fresh air that's coming from outside, but the two air streams never mix. Um, and it's super efficient. So it's essentially like having the window open on with, with a, you know, the air is fresh outside, the window's open, but you're not getting any of the heat loss associated with that open window. Um, and meanwhile, you have, you have filters and you can, you can supplement with extra filters for wildfires so that the outside air is being filtered of pollutants as it comes inside, um, maintaining indoor air quality. And here's the, and you're also getting oxygen rich air coming from outside, coming, coming inside and that stale air being expelled outside. So it's, it's a really key piece of performance and of health and happiness in, in passive house. All right, so those are the, the five. We had continuous insulation, air tightness, um, thermal bridge-free construction, high-performance windows and doors, and HRV ventilation. So real fast are the, the next five. Um, and, and the first one is shading. So we wanna um, be actively, or we want to manage, passively actually, manage the solar energy that it, we're, we're receiving from, from the sun um, on our buildings. So in the winter, we probably wanna capture that, but in other times of the year, we wanna, we wanna shade from it so we don't overheat. That's where shading comes in. Orientation and form is really important. Um, and the, there's something called the for, heat loss form factor, or the form heat loss factor. Um, so I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on this slide, but essentially as you go from yellow to red, you're getting more and more uh, difficult to uh, deal with form factor. So the simplest form factor is a big cube because there's a really advantageous relationship between the surface area on that cube and the volume. And so that's a really great form uh, heat loss factor. And it's easy to do passive house with, with something like that. Um, as you get a bunch of articulation or you cut that cube in a bunch of, into a bunch of single family houses, then the, heat for, the, the form heat loss factor um, gets higher and it's still possible to do passive house. It's done all the time, but it takes more energy and, and more expense. So we wanna optimize whenever we can um, for form. Uh, daylighting and solar gain, yeah, um, you know, basically we've got freebies available to us in capturing uh, daylight and solar gain when, when we want them. And this is, this is a project of, of Michael's that does a beautiful job of that um, throughout most of the year. And moisture management. So uh, we do, we wanna um, use membranes that are, that can uh, allow vapor to escape um, and, and uh, are vapor closed at different times, depending on the physics of the assembly. So that's what we see on the upper left-hand corner with the corner with the Intello membrane. We can use rain screens to help dry uh, exterior walls. That was, that's what we see on the upper right. We wanna make sure we're dealing with, with bulk water and making sure there's no intrusion of bulk water. That's what we see on the bottom there with, with uh, um, uh, membranes in the basement. Uh, so moisture management is a key piece of durability. And finally, efficient domestic hot water and distribution. Um, and so we're using heat pump water heaters in our projects like the Sandin CO2 heat pump, um, and then making sure that our piping is done um, efficiently uh, to conserve energy and water. So that's a lot to throw at you. And we do have some time for, for questions and answers. Um, these are some resources. We, we will send all registrants a one pager with um, links as well. Um, and uh, some links to articles and links to these resources, but these are organizations, all these organizations have more passive house information. Um, most of them also have passive, all of them have passive house training available. Um, so with that, I think I'll stop. Thanks everybody.
Thank you, Zach. That was great. Packed a lot in there. Um, so the first question is from Paul. Paul, if you want to unmute and ask your question. Sure. Um, I think it would be helpful, uh, particularly for the new people here, uh, to get an explanation of the difference between uh, embodied energy and or embodied carbon and uh, carbon sequestering. Um, sequestering because I don't think it's always uh, obvious to everyone how we're using that. Yeah, that's a really good question. I mean, and uh, so I'll do my best to to summarize that. I mean, so. Um, embodied carbon refers to the carbon emissions that were created to um, create a component or a material um, that goes into a building or the building itself. So it includes things like um, the uh, fuel used to transport goods, that you, the fuel used on site uh, by the, track, the, the heavy equipment. Um, as well as all the energy that goes into manufacturing a heat recovery ventilation system, you know, for example. S carbon sequestration is the potential to use some natural based, um, I think is probably all natural based, right? Um, so plant based materials to actually store the carbon that the plant has captured during its life, um, sucking up carbon as it does, you know, as it's growing storing that in and sequestering it in a building material for the life of the building. Um, so, in, so you can th almost think of, um, of carbon sequestration as, as like negative embodied carbon, which is why the term embodied carbon is so, is, is, is so weird um, because it makes it sound like a, a good thing. It really should be called upfront carbon emissions. Um, yeah. But you know, another piece in, uh... Uh, of what I love about the accelerator and Sydney, thanks for keep putting these uh, links in the chat. Um, last week we had Chris Magwood on and the link is there and you should watch it. It, it is, uh, you know, so very often these questions will come up during just typical talks about a project and all of a sudden we're like, ah, this person's like the expert in that. And then they'll come on and, and the way he described it is, is just incredible. Cindy put the link down there. All of our stuff is online now and you could watch it. But uh, but uh, but thanks, Zach, that was great. And by the way, while I'm speaking for two seconds, now everyone know, knows why Zach is the director of the Pass Great, um, the next question is from Charles. Hi, I hope you guys can hear me. My audio might not be great, but um, Zach, that was a great presentation, thank you. Thanks. Um, I just had a question, you know, it's it passive house. I've never done um, a passive house design, but more and more we're doing work that is, is highly sealed, heavily sealed. And it does tend to reduce all those, those sound, um, uh, nasty sound things that come from the outside. But, but what about what's generated inside as part of the building? You've got continuous fans going and ventilation. Um, you probably have heat pump equipment and sometimes having sort of a background sound that, that drowns out some of the odd noises um, is a good thing. So I was just wanted to talk a little bit about sound quality and what you actually hear inside of a passive house project. Thanks. No, I, get that. Yeah. I, I get asked that a lot. So, so I live in a passive house as well. <clears throat> um, so, I mean, I don't, besides my ERV, which you can't hear, um, I mean, I'm sure you could if you really tried to. And when I put it on boost, you can you can hear it a bit. Um, but it's quiet. My mechanical's not running right now. Um, so I don't hear anything. Uh, in fact, actually three floors up, I might be able to hear my refrigerator um, uh, uh, clock on or off, or you just hear noises you wouldn't hear because they're so quiet. Um, you can hear things you would never have heard before because it's such a serene environment. My bedroom's in the front. I don't hear the garbage truck. Um, uh, if you go on the accelerator's Instagram, you'll you'll see I do videos of it. I tried to not do so many because I'm annoying people, but um, but it's 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 like a it's a funny thing where you hear it, you don't. But in the houses, I mean, you, you we've reduced the mechanical so much that there's almost no mechanical to hear. Um, even the fan speed on the Mitsubishi of my house, I have, we have a heat pump hot water a heat pump hot water heater that's in the cellar. We have a um, the VRF, ours is a Mitsubishi. 
on my HVAC system, it's it's also running on low when it is run. But um, I think this winter I'll use my heat maybe 10 times a year total. So, you know, the mechanicals get really quiet and the houses get really quiet. So you hear, you definitely hear things you wouldn't have heard otherwise. So dealing with acoustics is important. Having nothing to do with passive house, but dealing with acoustics is always important. And the next question is from Amisha. Hello, thank you. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Yeah, I'm here. Awesome. Um, okay, so let's see. Really, this was the only question that I had. The other was I was asking for a reference because I was really interested in that brain function study. But um, so my question was regarding the sort of financial accessibility for homeowners at maybe something that's not going to be your high end residential project. Um, one of the things I'm particularly interested in is the accessibility of good design. Um, so in terms of those kind of retrofits, uh, would it be, um, is it really accessible for homeowners who may be lower to middle class, which is 45 to $95,000 annual income, or even for lower class homeowners, which would be uh, 20,000 to 44.9 thousand a year, uh, many of which are also probably renters, but um, in terms of access to these sort of uh, technologies for passive house retrofits. You're going to go, Michael? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I, I was going to actually recommend, um, uh, and, I, and maybe we can find one, Tim McDonald, I think, talks about this, uh, for, in my opinion, best, and I, I can't I can never remember the other developer's name, Zach, that, that, that spoke about it, where some of these developers that are doing it now, are, they're, they're doing it, well, actually, and um, uh, the, the the large passive house project that's being done upper, up uh, uptown that you showed a picture of before. These are all affordable housing projects um, where where they are um, either 100% affordable or, or mostly affordable. So there are affordable housing developers currently doing this right now. Um, and in some of their cases, they're doing it cost neutral, in some cases cheaper, depending on how often they've been doing it and how large a project gets. So um, in terms of a retrofit, um, almost regardless of your budget size, the smaller the house, the, the, the more expensive the Delta might be, but the products are getting cheaper and cheaper right now. Um, uh, when I started doing this, there was no UPVC window that you could buy. Now they're all over the place in Europe and there's one in New Jersey um, and, and they're competing with the, with the low cost uh, window companies really well. So I think uh, as materials get lower and lower and we can, we, we can bring it to our, uh, people who are renovating smaller homes uh, better and better. I think, I think it's happening, it's happening very fast. I don't know if that, if that fully answered it. Yeah, um, I, yeah, no, it definitely gets there. It was really in terms of the retrofit because I'm trying to think mm -hmm. of things that are existing housing stock, you know, the bricks we yeah. already have on the wall, um, but also if that could be implemented more widely and if it's an accessible option for kind of your more, let's say uh, your median homeowner. I mean, I'll give you a couple of just passive uh, passive uh, measures that, that we do. You know, if someone's redoing the roof anyway, um, and they, to, to also install rigid insulation um, below the new roofing, you know, obviously they're doing a tariff at that point, but, um, but I think a lot of people are, depending on what house they have. Do the rigid insulation first, catch the heat before it ever makes it into the house. There are some things they can do. Um, there's a great window company in New Jersey, so the lead times are like nothing. And... Um, uh, and uh, the, he sells a fantastic UPVC window that really competes with Anderson, like really well. And um, so it's, I think it's happening faster and faster. So that's just the window and the roof. I mean, obviously to go full passive, you'd have to almost gut the house. And just coming back to the embodied carbon conversation, we're not gutting every project we're, we're working on. Sometimes it just doesn't pay to do that. You have to ask yourself the question, not only what is my payback, but do I really want to rip all that out? Does it really make sense? Um, and so I think small moves like that, again, not fully answering your question, uh, because I think if I did, I think the answer right now would be maybe a, a no, but, but at the same time, it may be. Yeah, so. I, I mean, yeah, good answer and great question. You're identifying um, kind of the cutting edge of where the, the community is in North America and also globally right now in terms of trying to dial in retrofits in general, and especially retrofits for, for, for smaller buildings. Um, and so there, the like Rocky Mountain Institute, New Buildings Institute, uh, the New York State Energy and Research Development Authority, FIAS, 
PHI are all looking at, at um, models and looking at the potential for um, for retrofits that you could do where you where you um, basically um, and one one practitioner in the UK uh, has a brand has branded it a tea cozy. <laughs> so basically, you're taking you 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 can retrofit all from the outside um, with integrated mechanical systems um, uh, in in this this kind of envelope unit, um, and so. That, and that's based on the the approach called energy sprung or energy sprung from from Belgium. Uh, so if you're if you're curious about like um, some of the more interesting approaches to cracking this nut, because it's not it is the toughest nut to crack with uh, energy. Just I mean not just passive house, but just energy performance of existing buildings, especially smaller ones. Um, if you're looking for kind of the some of the most interesting thinking and models, energy sprung is a good one to look at. And the PHI is taking the energy sprung um, concept and and applying um, its passive house retrofit to it, and it's called outfit with a PH. So out PHI IT for for fit. Um, so the you know, it, it feels to me, it feels like with the clean energy, you know, when you look at the clean energy transition and where, you know, um, solar, the cost of solar was, you know, 10 years ago, it feels similar where there are things that are not right now necessarily, um, we haven't dialed in how to make them really cost effective, like new construction, no, no, no brainer, total no brainer. Many, retrof many retrofits of many different kinds of buildings, we can absolutely do it. And then we're, we're still in some Building types were still approaching that place where it makes sense to do a, a, a full pass house retrofit. We're it's not, just, yeah, we're still getting you. there. Yeah. You're just two notes on it. One is it's, it's one of the reasons why we're, as a firm who does a lot of retrofits, trying to create a repeatable approach. Because although I work on a lot of high end projects, the same repeatable approach we're, we're taking can be done in less expensive homes. But two, just going back to what, what Zach was saying, I, I can't remember the name of the talk, which means I can't remember the name of the standard they're coming out with. But uh, I was just at the FIAS conference in Tarrytown, and they also now are starting a, a retrofit uh, standard, which which will start to, I think, play really well into what was, was described just now. Um, I'm sure it'll be live on their site momentarily. It was really fun to be in the, in the presentation. I have no memory, so I can't remember anything, but and, it'll be uh, on their site. We'll provide Paul, the link. Paul Heron's uh, comment is right on. The predicate question with regard to retrofit is whether the homeowner can afford to do a retrofit in the first place. If yes, the incremental cost for high performance is relatively affordable, and that is definitely what we're what we're seeing. If you're gonna if you're gonna go there, do it right. Um, another link I just dropped in the chat is to a green uh, mortgage program that they're piloting in Vermont right now, which would roll the cost of a deep energy retrofit into the cost of your mortgage, giving people the benefit of paying that off long term, and it also works for refinancing, making it more affordable for um, middle class families. Um, the next question is from Joy. Joy, are you still here? <laughs> yes. Um, hi. Uh, so basically, I'm from Toronto, and um, I'm just kind of curious on what 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 do we need to um, decide on if we will go to PHI or FIUSE uh, to take the certification course? Um, I think there's a difference on the two. Um, yeah, I think I think that maybe take a look at the your local market and what is what what um, maybe you know so it's, it's more of a practical consideration of like what what um, are there pol public policies where you are that are um, driving adoption of one certification over the other. You could take a look at it that way. Um, I and as. Aside from that, they're both really good. They're both really strong training programs and, and really strong um, uh, certifications. And uh, so you, you, in some ways, you can't go wrong. They're, di they're different because the, the two certifications are different. So I think it would be more like, what, what do you think is the most likely one that you're going to be using in your practice based on your market? Unfortunately, I have to sign off. So it was good seeing everyone. Um, Thanks, um, Michael. Thank you very much, everyone. I put my email in chat if anybody has any questions they didn't get to it. Yeah. Thank you.
Thank Thanks, you. Michael. So we're, we're losing our, our practitioner right now. So that means that there are probably some questions that I'm not going to be able to answer. But I have put my, my email address in chat as well. It's Zach, Z-A-C-K, at PassiveHouseAccelerator.com. And so if e either we don't have time to get to your question or I'm not able to answer it now, um, please follow up with me and um, I can get an expert to, to help you with your question. And it looks like the next question is from Sajil. Um, looks like maybe they're not here anymore. Uh, so Sarah. Yeah, um, mine's kind of a, maybe a bit of a crazy question, but it's just, I was wondering uh -oh. if there's any technology to incorporate composting within multi-residential buildings and use that heat within heat recovery ventilators. Oh, interesting. Sounds like you've got a project on your hands. <laughs> I think I've been thinking no, about it since I, I first learned I feel, the concept of heat recovery, but yeah. Well, I feel like I feel like that there 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 may have been some experimentation with this, with just using an H uh, using an HRV with the composting uh, toilets at the bullet center. I could be making that up, um, but you do you definitely you definitely have some heat, and you're expelling that heat, and the air streams aren't mixing. So I mean, I think that. You could probably get creative with an HRV. Cool, look into that. Thanks. Yeah. <laughs> Good um, question. That's interesting. Yeah, that was interesting. Is Roger here? Perhaps not. Um, oh yeah, Roger's here. Oh, there you are. Good to see you. Uh, I forgot what my question was. Oh, I know. I just I just talked to an architect friend of mine who uh, uh, were collaborating on a uh, passive house, a couple of them, and uh, he mentioned that um, that there's a prescriptive path. This is too much jargon. Just tell me so. Uh, but you know, avoiding the woofy model, which can be laborious, as you know, um, there's a he mentioned a prescriptive path, and I I just learned this like yesterday. Yeah, and that's been the case for some time, but. If that helps accelerate, pun intended, um, getting you know getting through that to uh, basically you know speed up the time of you know design uh, iteration to to a viable you know um, so educate me some more. Is that is this something that just happened or it's been half? Yeah, time? yeah, no, good question, good question. The, the prescriptive path is available through FIAS on, on the FIAS side. PHI does not have a prescriptive path. And, uh, and I think it's been around for a year and, uh, or maybe nine months, maybe nine months. And it was, it was developed specifically to deal with the scale, the scale question. How, how do you make it easier and easier and easier for more and more people to do, um, to do passive house level buildings? So when we say pre prescriptive, everybody that means you're you're following rules like your wall has to have a certain r value you're not you're not dealing you're not going through a modeling the modeling software of Woofy, Woofy passive that roger just referred to um so it you lose you lose some of the kind of flexibility as a designer and the ability to like really kind of like you know experiment with optimizing one par parameter of your design and seeing what that does to the rest of the design but it means that it's a lot easier for for somebody to just kind of plug and chug and like okay you just just tell me how to do it and i'll and i'll do it so um it's a really interesting it, it's an exciting um experiment you know it's it's uh um so there it's definitely a, a place that's it's they're kind of blazing new territory there and i'm i'm hopeful that it, and i'm sure there's going to be a lot of learnings and that they'll incorporate those learnings into into the next iteration of, of the prescriptive path. But um, yeah, it's really interesting. That's exciting. Well, thanks for taking the question. Uh, just a quick follow-up because um, I'm in Western Mass and we build in Vermont and you mentioned uh, this uh, sort of pathway for uh, financing and mortgaging uh, high performance. Uh, and we, we did a couple in Southern Vermont successfully and, and one of them went through that program. And um, while it's not mandatory uh, in, any state in the union that I'm aware of, there is some migration to the promise of lending institutions 
taking into consideration, you know, the amount of energy that a building uses over the over its of its lifespan or or just what it's you know monthly yearly is, and and thereby making a a loan uh, pathway more uh, to a lower income. So that you know you can you know, your mortgage cost is reduced by your energy cost being reduced, and so um, I wouldn't say it's targeted specifically to low-income housing. And this this was propagated by uh, if that's the word uh, put forward by this woman out of Florida, and I have that information somewhere, and I, I, if I can find it, I'll share it. But uh, more and more talking to lending institutions about please take this into consideration, particularly when you're we're in Massachusetts. You know, sometimes there'll be appraisers who are like out of New Jersey and they, they don't know the local market and they will not, they won't take it into consideration. So anyway, that's my, that's my 10 minutes of fame. <laughs> yeah, no, that's great. Thank you, Roger. Yeah, well, please, if you find that, please share it. That's really, okay. yeah, it's a really important, there, there are all these, we've got this interesting kind of patchwork of different, you know, in different places and different regions from different sources, you know, maybe get, get, you know, a couple of basis points off of a loan or, or some incentive and, it's really great to to um, uh, we we need a we need a clearinghouse of all of it. We really do, and and Efficiency Vermont, uh, you may know of, is is the entity th through which that that uh, sort of helped uh, you know make make that so. And uh, and they're and they're a national organization. So if you're not familiar with an Efficiency Vermont, uh, I'll, I'll see if I can send that along too. So anyway, I don't want to capitalize the time here, but thank you. Great presentation. Well, yeah. Yeah. yeah, thanks, Roger. Yeah. yeah. Um, I just I just noticed a, I just got a, a, a chat um, from somebody who who it looks like at least on one of our missives about the event they, we had the 2 p.m. Eastern written instead of 1 p.m. Eastern written. So first of all, I'm, I'm sorry to the person who chatted that and, and to everybody else. If, you, if there's anybody else who arrives arrive late and you're frustrated, I'm sorry. We, we have recorded this session and we'll um, have it available as a video. So you will be you will be able to see it. It probably will be ready next week. Um, so, so our apologies, uh, apologies for that. And it looks like uh, the next question is from Tristine. Perhaps you're not here anymore. Um, can hear me. Mm -hmm. You can hear me. Great. Thanks. Yeah. So, um, uh, my name is Tris. Thanks for taking my question. We're hoping to build a passive house in 2022. Um, we're at about 50% design phase, and we're we're now asked to make certain uh, decisions on um, components of the passive house. And I was wondering um, how a soon-to-be new homeowner would best use your website to get um, direction and more details on all the choices that are ahead for us. Yeah, it's a really good question. I, th I feel like there's that's an area that we need that we'll be building out more and more on the website. The the first the first um, kind of audience for the website are are has been have been practitioners um, or people like passive house curious architects, um, and and so there it's a little bit it's a little bit less right now a, a little bit less aimed at um, homeowners, but that definitely needs to change as we as we grow. Um, so, I mean, I think, do you have, are you working with a past house consultant already? Um, we're, uh, our architect um, has built passive houses. Um, so we're not the first. Right. And, yeah. and um, but um, we don't know what we don't know. So like I put yeah. in the chat, you know, we're, you know, do we, do we choose between a ducted heating system or um, a non-ducted one, radiant floor heat? And, you know, do we worry about cooling and, um, you know, the choices go beyond just price, you know, we mm -hmm. want to make sure we get performance and just trying to find information that helps um, soon to be homeowners make the best decisions. Yeah. Right, and 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 also how to navigate the answer that often comes, which is it depends, right? right. <laughs> so yeah, so uh, I think that I think my my recommendation. Um, so I don't have a good answer in terms of the best way to to engage with the website at this moment, um, but but my more my other response would be to um, to either lean on the architect or if you feel like maybe you need to. Um, uh, another opinion or somebody who has been through 
you know, dozens of projects instead of a, a few um, to seek out a, a, a um, experienced certified pass files consultant um, to, to help be that astounding board and help you think through key questions. All right. Um, thank you so much. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks for being here. The next question is from Mazdek. Hi, yes, my question was about more about the market and especially multifamily residential market in which we see there's a high demand for full height glass and uh, high window to wall ratios. So at this point, is it safe to say that passive house is a solution for punch wall facade or do we have examples of like full height glass that are operable with operable panels that mm. you know passive house could be applied to? I mean, my gen the general response is if given the budget, you can do anything to, you know, uh, so, but I, the, um, I see Scott on, uh, Scott on the call. Scott, Scott, are you, are you familiar with any um, full height glass projects? I mean, there are, there, are, there are projects with lots of glazing. And I think that the, the, um, I don't know if I, this answers your question or not, but the, the Boston project, for example, that I showed, um yeah but, i worked on that project the, oh, the office okay. portion of that uh, okay, i mean great the office is passive house yeah uh, and the rest is you know normal it's lead platinum right yeah 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 i mean it is it is uh i th there probably aren't a ton of yeah i'm not sure that there's an example uh, at this point um yeah. yeah and the thing with the office is that office is obviously does not have um operable panels so it's it can be triple pane glass, but um, you don't get fresh air through you know through passive ways. Right. Um, just curious about like you know where the market is going and if there are, there are ways to you know implement implement this good yeah, strategy. You know. Right. Right. And and what is and also technology. It's it's where the market is going, and then also probably some questions about technology, like what technologies are available to to. Um, accomplish that. Um, you know, we should we should include the Discord channel link because um, we do have we have a Discord channel that is uh, a, a place to where you could um, pose questions like this, and um, you're more likely to get somebody who's knowledgeable about uh, about that area to to respond. Um, so I think. Um, do you have that? So I'll, so I'll I'll look for that 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 link. Um, and we'll get it to you. Thank you. Chat. Oh, you got it. Okay, cool. Yeah, I'm searching yeah. for it. Uh, the next question is from Holly. Hi, sorry. I thought you were just going to pick up the question from uh, the chat. So my question is, and Zach, I think I sent you some of these questions uh, last week. We actually are that middle-class homeowner. Yeah. Trying to build a passive high performance house and we had an architect who we had designed it ourselves and then we had an architect help us uh, finish the drawings get it all ready and then right before code review she inexplicably left the project and we have no experts to ask questions of and there's a few lingering things that worry us and one of those is how to finish the interior um, because we've got a hero wrap over sips on the outside and we understand that you know that sips can be you know subject to um, uh, you know like tea kettling and getting moisture trapped in there. So we want to make sure we finish the inside correctly. And so my understanding is you leave most of that exposed on the inside. You don't try and seal up the inside, but you do do the sip joints. Does that sound correct to you? This this is I need to defer this question to to somebody who's who's more expert. Um, I, and also 475, so I, I, I 475 high performance building supply should also be able to help. And there was some progress. So we, I think we, we, Holly, we, you and I exchanged an email uh, um, what I think last week, right? And um, there, uh, there was some progress, I, I think, in, or some movement in, in getting, <laughs> getting some answers for you. So I'll, um, after the, the event, um, I'll ping you and, and Sean. Um, yeah. And see where that's at, so you can get you can because they they're they they're very familiar with it, hero, and I think could be helpful. 
Yeah, and that's who we bought it from. Um, right, right. We asked them a few questions, and they've been very helpful along the way. But yeah, we are to comment on the the question, the issue of affordability. You know, we are definitely pushing the boundaries of it, and things like that prescriptive uh, process, mm -hmm. things make it so it's less um, a mystery to homeowners, a less you know, uh, less intimidating more answers out there, more examples, more models that people can look at certainly would help, I think. Yeah, that's really, this is really valuable feedback to, it's it's great to hear from homeowners um, today. Um, I think it helps us think about um, ways ways that we can be, sort you know, be of service um, to the community of uh, all of us who wanna do these in a, for our own homes. <laughs> so um, that's great. Thank you. Yeah, thanks. Um, and then we just have one more question from Jessica. Jessica's still here. Um, the question Jessica had was about air quality monitors and uh, oh, right. if you had a recommendation on one. Well, I really, I, I have um, the AWARE monitor, so A-W-A-I-R. Um, and uh, a lot of um, a lot of folks on the accelerator uh, in the accelerator community use use that that so that, that's what I would recommend. So oh, aware, and it and it has it has um, it monitors CO two and and uh, VOCs and and all that. Great. Um, so that was all the questions we had. Unless anyone else has another question that didn't get answered. Cool. Well, everybody, thank you so much for for coming here and for sticking it out for an hour and a half. This is great to great to um, be able to share about Passive House. Um, we have a big uh, so in addition to the Construction Tech Tuesday program and the Happy Hour Showcase program this Wednesday, uh, we also have a special event on Friday, which is at um, is it eleven Pacific two Eastern, or do I is it <laughs> so, but let me double check. Like, yeah, we, yes, it's, yeah, we want to make sure we get it right. But if you want to like see a real project and a really interesting project, we're going to be doing a live virtual tour of a retrofit of a historic firehouse in Manhattan. It's being transformed into a multifamily building. Um, and this is part of the kickoff of what's called International Passive House Days. So you'll also get connected to resources of, of virtual tours that are happening around the world and some open, live open houses that are happening this weekend in the US. So uh, Friday, Friday will be a, a really fun, um, could be a really fun kind of complement to this, this little primer on Passive House. You can take what you learned today and, and see it um, being applied in the real world. And that is at 11 a.m. 11 a.m. Pacific, 2 p.m. Eastern. Yeah. Okay, yeah. cool. Great. Well, I think that's it. Thanks, you know Sydney. Where to find us. Yeah, yeah, thank you all so much. Yeah.